Good morning, Greenwood Presbyterian Church. What a week we have lived in the past few days together. When you put your sermon thoughts together early in a week, you have no idea what the reality of our world and culture are going to look like just a few days, a few hours later. And on the one hand, I'd love to address some of what we've seen play out in our culture and in our world this week. And on another hand, I conclude that what we have prepared for and what the Lord's given us is what we're going to consider while we're together. But it did seem appropriate to me to at least have a brief word for some of what we see our nation enduring together. And quite simply, I would put it this way. In the, in the last few hours and days of our week, consider how we have seen how awesome humanity can be and yet how awful humanity can be. Yesterday, my family gathered around the television and we watched the awesome display of SpaceX and Elon Musk and NASA as they took off into orbit and went into space. And if you watched like I did, there was something very awesome about it. All of the human engineering and mathematical calculations that we are capable, that some are capable of doing, they said that the, the space shuttle traveling at 17,000 miles per hour would dock to a space station that was also traveling 17,000 miles per hour and that these things would have to be perfectly synced. And I thought, how awesome is humanity, what God has made us to be. And yet within those same hours, all of our television showed us how immensely awful humanity can be. The unjust taking of life, the abuse of authority and trust, brutality from trusted authority, and then rioting and rage and anger. I think I would want us all as a church family to feel the tension of humanity. What we are immensely capable of on the one hand and immensely capable of on the other. And I want to remind you that it is the Christian church and the Christian scriptures that have a category for how both extremes can be true. That we are created in the image of God and have this immense ability. And yet we are fallen and ruined by sin and have this immense ability to sin. And that's the tension that we live in in our world. And it's not new today. It's not new this week. But every once in a while, there's a manifestation of it that shows the reality of it. And so as you live through these hours and these days of the coming week, consider those two categories. The beauty and wonder, the awfulness, the horror, the tragedy, the misery. And God has placed His church in the midst of it to speak and offer the hope of reconciliation to God and to man which is through the gospel alone. Amen? Amen. In our time together, we've been considering different hymns of the church. We've been talking about the music of the church. And oftentimes I feel like I'm repeating myself to you. For those of you who have heard every sermon, perhaps I am repeating myself to you. But this morning I want to begin speaking to those who maybe are hearing this for the first time or who have heard just a few. And let me make this point. When we talk about music, can we admit that music has power? Music has power to motivate. You know, there are reasons why our colleges invest so much money in having marching bands for their sports teams and that they pay to send these marching bands to play their fight songs when their team travels on the road. Because mu music is even at the center of our
our sports culture. And some of you know, it doesn't matter what you do, if, if you're an amateur athlete, if you run, you very well may listen to music because it inspires you, it motivates you, it picks up your step. Some of you who have to work late at night or rise early in the morning, some of you use music to inspire you, to motivate you, to awaken you. Students can use music to put a little fire in their soul. And so music is a God-given gift that can motivate. It has a power to work in the human heart and in the soul. But music is more than just that which can hype us up. Music has the ability to calm us. Music can calm a troubled heart. Music can bring peace in the midst of chaos, depending on what the music is. But it can be harnessed and used to bring calm in the midst of chaos. And then also, music has the power to help us to remember. I could play a tune from the 50s or 60s, and some of you would perk up because it was the music of your childhood. Or I could play a hymn of old and it might tear you up because it reminds you of a funeral or of a person long gone. I know that the hymn that we've chosen to emphasize today, Be Thou My Vision, to many of you that's a very meaningful hymn. It might remind you of a wedding or of a funeral or of a grandparent. I know that for the last 17 years, we've used that hymn at Erskine College in our baccalaureate service as a prayer for our graduates that they would know that it is the Lord alone who can be their vision, which we'll talk about what that means. And so music is powerful, and that's why we're considering different hymns of the church. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson says this, though, about worship and worship music. He says this, The foundation of worship in our heart is not emotional. It's theological. Now think about that. The foundation, the real substance of worship in our heart, we might think that it's emotional when we get worked up or welled up, but it's not. It's theological because it's the truth that empowers us not the tune or the emotion. And so as we've emphasized these hymns, remember we're talking about gospel truth, that it's something worth singing about. And so I'm trying to bang that drum each week to see the truth in the hymn and that that might be the reason that you love the hymn. We have an Irish tune with our hymn this morning, and some of you love it because it's an Irish tune. But we want to love this hymn because the truth of what it teaches us and helps us to remember. Our passage this morning is not the one listed. Um, I have several curveballs. I apologize, but that is the nature of how this morning will go. Our text you'll just have to listen to unless you pull it up on your phone. It's Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 with the theme of Be Thou My Vision in Mind. Listen to God's word. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's pray that God will bless our understanding of his word. Lord, that is our simple prayer together, that you would help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, that we would not grow weary and lose heart. 
And so, Lord, would you be our vision this morning and this week and all the days of our lives. Open our eyes now to see the beauty of the truths that are encapsulated in this hymn. We pray this, we ask this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymns of acclamation and hymns of aspiration. I want to make a brief comment about that difference as we get into this hymn. There are hymns of acclamation, there are hymns of aspiration. So what's the difference between the two? Quite simply, a hymn of acclamation is a hymn of praise where we acclaim, we worship God for finished work. We praise God, we acclaim the name of the Lord for a finished work. And most of the hymns that we sing are hymns of acclamation. I love hymns of acclamation. I love singing about finished work. That is the good news of the gospel. But there are also hymns of aspiration. And these are really almost prayers of things that we wish to be true. Things that we aspire to do that we want to be true about us and the lives that we live. So there was a line of aspiration in the hymn, in the song we sang just a few minutes ago. And I can't quote it exactly, but it said something like, Lord, all of my days are going to serve you. All of my heart is going to serve you. It was something like that. That is an aspiration. That is something we aspire to be true. The truth is we know this week we will go to Walmart and we will get in a line of people and we will get frustrated and we will not honor the Lord with our thoughts or with our words. Right? So it was aspiration when we say we want every word, every thought, every breath to serve the Lord or that it will serve the Lord. Our hymn, Be Thou My Vision, is both acclamation and aspiration. And I want to highlight that with some of the things that we'll hear this morning. But we're going to look at three brief stanzas of the hymn try to apply those to our lives, and then go live the week that God has put before us. So the first statement in the hymn is simply this. Be thou my vision. Well, what does that mean? Be thou my vision. So for the last few years, my eyes are deteriorating. I cannot see like I used to. I used to preach from a little small print Bible. I can't use that Bible anymore unless I pull out my reading glasses, which I don't like to wear. When I awaken in the morning and check my phone for any text messages, I can't read those text messages first thing in the morning anymore. My vision has deteriorated. So sometimes I will hand whatever I'm looking at or trying to look at to someone near me and say, Be my vision. Read this to me. What does this paint can say in the small print? I cannot read it. And I'll have my children in the past week read the small print on the back of the paint can. Is that what it means to be thou my vision? No, it's really not. Be thou my vision really is captured well in that Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 passage where it says to fix your eyes on Jesus. Be thou my vision is to have clear eyes. It is to have a focused vision. It is to have a fixed gaze upon the truth of the gospel, upon the person of God, and to not let yourself be cloudy-eyed or distracted from what you know to be true, from the person and work of Christ himself. Be thou my vision is to say, Lord, it's a prayer, Lord, keep me focused, keep me centered, keep my heart, the eyes of my heart, the mind of my heart fixed on you. And so in that way, it's a prayer, and it's a good prayer. It is a good prayer to say, Lord, be my vision, be my focus, center me on you in everything that I do, in work and in play in family, in all I do and say, fix my eyes on Jesus. That's what it means to be thou my vision. It is to have 
clear eyes and to say, Lord, don't let me drift. Don't let me wander. The second stanza in the hymn I'll emphasize is this aspiration. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. All right, so what does it mean to heed? It means to notice or to pay attention to, to be aware of. And yes, this would be an aspiration. There's a little part of you that should feel dishonest when you sing this line of this hymn, just like I do. Riches I heed not. Don't even pay attention to wealth, to money, to the worries of this life. I don't even notice man's praise. Right? That's an aspiration. That's what we want to be true. That's what we pray to be true. But I know my heart, and you know your heart, we heed the worries of this life. We're aware of them. We notice them. And we love man's praise. Right? If you do a good job, you like to be acknowledged for that. You look in the mirror before you go out in public. Most of you. You comb that hair. You take those showers. You dress yourself appropriately because we want people to think well of us. It is an aspiration. It is a prayer. Lord, may I not be driven or dominated by riches or by the praise of men. May those things not define me. And it's a good prayer. It's a prayer of the church. Lord, don't let the worries of this life, the pursuits of this life, don't let, let, let them be what dominates my heart, my mind, or my affections. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 9 says this. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that is garbage, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. He says, riches, the praise of men, I count it rubbish. I count it garbage. Right? He is speaking harshly about the things our hearts tend to be impassioned about. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Someone put it this way. The wealth of treasure that we have in Christ far outweighs the approval that we seek from others. The wealth of treasure, we, believers in Christ, what we have in Christ far outweighs that approval that we're always seeking from other people. Can you say that this morning? Can that be your aspiration? Lord, may I be satisfied with what you've given me and who you've made me to be and not be grappling after the things, the rubbish of this life. That word rubbish is garbage. It's just a nicer sounding word for it. Remember when I was a little boy, my mother would tell me to take the garbage out. And there was one particular time that the garbage was really nasty and really stinky. And I said, Mom, I don't want to take the garbage out. It's gross. She said, Take the garbage out. As if changing the word glorified it a little bit. And now we still call it the garbage in our house because of, that, because of that day. At the end of the day, garbage is garbage and rubbish is rubbish. The Apostle Paul has said, the attractions of this life are but rubbish compared to the wealth that we have in Christ. That is a full heart. A heart that is not empty and longing for something out here that's created to fill it, that's a full heart. And that's what the gospel offers us, that kind of fullness. Is your heart full or is your heart empty? When you think about the season of life that you're in, are you trying to fill the emptiness of your heart with that person, with that thing, with that whatever it is? 
Are you trying to fill the emptiness of your heart with something that can never satisfy it? We're all in the business of doing that. And the Apostle Paul is calling our attention outside of it in Scripture this morning. And then the third point from the hymn, the third lyric I'll emphasize is this. High King of Heaven, my victory won. High King of Heaven, my victory won. W-O-N, as in victory. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14 says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest that is Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. You know, you don't sit down and rest until the work is done. When the work is completed, you sit down. And here it says that the priest, when the work was completed, sat down at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. In John chapter 19, verse 30, on the cross, Jesus himself said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. I want you to feel as we sing that hymn this morning, the finished work of Christ. He declared that it was finished. The author of Hebrews reminds us that he has sat down because his work is finished. And you and I get to live every day of every week, if you're a Christian, in the confidence of finished work. Finished work on your behalf. That's the beauty of the gospel. And you put all these things together, and some of you, very few of you are tracking with me on this, but what we have is, you put the hymn together, clear eyes, full hearts, and you can't lose because the victory has been won for you. Some of you know that a couple years ago there was a popular teenage show, it's now on Netflix, called Friday Night Lights. I watched a few episodes of that show for one reason. My best friend called me and said, Paul, you and Marie have got to watch this show. It's great. And the reason he thought we would love it is because the show is about a high school football coach. I love football. Did you know that? A high school football coach whose wife is a guidance counselor. My wife is a guidance counselor. And so as my best friend watched these episodes of this high school drama, he's like, Paul and Marie would love this show. They've got to see it. So we made it through a few episodes, and finally Marie said, I'm done. <laughs> this is like my real life at work Monday through Friday. This is horrible. I don't want to watch my life on television. But I watched a few more episodes, and there is one takeaway for me, that for those of you who've seen it. By the way, I'm not recommending this show. Nope, not recommending it. High school drama, not worth watching. But there's one thing in it that I'll take as a sermon illustration, and it's this. It's the halftime speech that the coach would make to inspire his players. And the author, the writer... Um, of the show, they didn't know that this would stick and take off like it did. I watched something on it this week. But it worked, and it became a refrain that would play episode after episode on occasion. And the, and the refrain was this. As he spoke to his players at halftime, he would say, Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. And if you're hearing that for the first time, it means very little to you. We're not talking about the football aspect of it. We're talking about the truth that for the Christian, 
God has called you to have clear eyes, to fix your eyes on Jesus, to never forget, to never forget who you are and whose you are. And that that truth should fill your heart. You should not be one left trying to fill your heart with created things to replace it with the Creator. Created things can never replace the Creator in your heart. And that's the only way you can have a full heart. And the ultimate promise of the Gospel is that you can't lose. There is a sure salvation that God has offered us in Christ. And so I offer that to you this morning as a summary, a true summary of the Gospel and of this hymn. Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. We're going to sing this hymn in just a moment. Let me tell you just a little bit about the hymn as we prepare to sing it. This hymn has a, a, a convoluted history. Some of you maybe looked into it this week when you heard we were going to do it. The origins of it lie apparently with St. Patrick in the 5th century. Some of the refrains seem to be connected to a prayer of St. Patrick in the 5th century. In the 8th century, a monk wrote a poem about St. Patrick and an event in St. Patrick's life where he defied the orders of the king. And the edict was that there would be no fires burned on a particular night. And St. Patrick said, I'm burning a fire and I'm burning it to the high king of heaven, to the only true king. And so he climbed the mountain or the hill of slain and he built a fire to honor the Lord and the king actually was impressed by this that St. Patrick would defy his edict out of a love for who he saw to be the one true king well many years later in 1905 I think it was that poem of St. Patrick was found and it was translated but it remained in archaic old English as it was translated from Irish. And so it was unusable. And then in 1912, Eleanor Hull put it to poetic verse in English so that we could sing it. By 1919, it found its way into a hymn book, and the tune given to it was an old Irish tune named Slain after the hill that St. Patrick had built his fire upon. A lot of history. If you're a history buff, you love that. Otherwise, you're thinking, can we just sing the hymn, please? Well, we are just going to sing the hymn as our music team comes up. Let me pray for us and let me remind you that it is the beauty of the truth, the gospel nuggets of truth that are in this hymn that make it worth singing. It may remind you of, of people long gone. It may remind you of events in your life, weddings or funerals. But it's the gospel truth that makes it worth singing. Let's pray together. <coughs> Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the beauty of this day. Beautiful skies, beautiful grass, beautiful temperature, comfort of a breeze. Thank you for a church family that would say, we're coming together to worship. Now, Lord, we pray that as we sing this song, like all of our other songs, that you would delight in it that the truths of it would go with us into the week ahead. And Lord, you would encourage your people. Even as we live in a discouraging time, we pray once more for our nation, for our land, for the injustices, for the need for the church to be the church, for the gospel to bring peace and to prevail. And we pray this all together, that you would be our vision. In Jesus' name, amen.